direct from the Football Association with expert guidance, tips, insights and more for the grassroots football community with Tom Lee and Charlotte Richardson. This, this is In The Box. Hello and welcome to In The Box, the brand new podcast brought to you by the Football Association. I'm Tom Lee and I'm National Club Services Manager here at the FA and I'm joined by my co-host Charlotte Richardson. Yes, that's right. Each episode of In The Box is set to equip you with expertise, advice and experience. We've got a whole range of amazing guests to introduce you to and to delve a little bit deeper into the world of grassroots football. Now, Tom, obviously, we made our In The Box debut. What's the reaction been like to our first performance? The reaction, Charlotte, has been absolutely superb. The This is the podcast for the grassroots football community and they have responded ever so well. Uh, We can't thank them enough. In terms of the resource hub on YouTube, we've had over 200 subscribers. We've had a thousand unique listens across the different podcast platforms that this is available on, as well as had some unique listens and views on the YouTube channel. We have, of course, delivered a couple of webinars of In The Box Extra Time as well, where we've focused on that in on funding and what that means for your club or league and the take up for that and the feedback we've had especially the one most recently Charlotte has been extremely positive. That's amazing to hear and it makes it really really rewarding to know that especially in these times that these podcasts and all of the content that we're putting together is really helping to make a difference and I'm really excited for today's episode because we're talking all about FA Charter Standard which I know is a topic that that means a lot to you personally Tom And for those who are tuned in that might not have heard of the FA Charter Standard before, it is a bespoke accreditation scheme for football, which is available to both clubs and leagues. Yeah, it is, Charlotte. And we're going to obviously dive into a little bit of the detail. We're going to dispel some of the myths around it. And you're right, I am really passionate about it. I I do do personally really love the accreditation programme. It's well-renowned. I've been involved with Charter Standard, both in a voluntary and uh, a, a paid capacity for a number of years. I first took my club through it in 2009 when we set up. And during my time at East Riding County FA as a football development officer, it was the main tool we used to support and service the grassroots game. And in my last three years here at the FA, I've had the great privilege and pleasure to be able to communicate exactly why it exists and continue to help drive those standards within the grassroots game. Well, on that note, Tom, I think we should uh, we should kick off. This, this is In The Box. So, Tom, FA Charter Standard, first question of many that I have for you, what is it? FA Charter Standard, it basically, in, in its drum-down sense, is uh, an accreditation scheme or an accreditation programme for clubs and leagues to adhere to a set of standards to show that they operate effectively and efficiently both on and off the field of play. And we mentioned it a little bit earlier, who's it for? Now, it is for clubs and leagues, but can it be any club or any league? It is for clubs and leagues, and there's a bit of a misconception around who's eligible here, so I'm going to hit you with a little bit of information. So, essentially... National League system steps one down to six. Those clubs and leagues are all eligible to be FA Charter Standard accredited, as is step seven feeder leagues and then the grassroots leagues below that that affiliate to their local county FA. And then in terms of the women and girls game, that is tier three and below. So any club and any league within that realm or landscape, if you like, are all eligible to be part of the accreditation. Okay, so that's really, really useful. And you are, having understood exactly what it is, why why does it exist? Well, it exists and it's been in existence for 20 years this, this season, this 2021. So it was launched for clubs back in 2001. And the reason it exists is it allows clubs and allows leagues to adhere to a set of standards. The reason we say it exists is it allows them to be the best places for people to play and enjoy the game. So whether you're a player, a spectator, a parent, a coach, a chairperson, a volunteer official, absolutely anyone. It means that when you turn up to play or train, it's a safe, fun, respectful and inclusive environment. It's one that you'll feel a part of and know that this club or league is adhering to a set of standards that places your value and your worth 
front and centre of why they exist? And whilst I have got a whole list of questions, I obviously did a little bit of homework before this episode. And I know that it isn't necessarily just about playing. It's not about who's a good player, who's a bad player. It's it's things that a whole, you know, a whole club needs to think about. So things written down here like coaching qualifications, inclusivity, governance, safeguarding. It's almost like a tick box exercise for a club or league. Yeah, and it is a tick box in the sense that there's criteria to satisfy, but it's not a tick box in the sense of the implementation of that criteria and what it actually means. So we talk we talk in terms of being on pitch and off pitch. So when we're talking on pitch, it's about having qualified volunteers that are all safeguarded. They've all got the relevant DBS checks. They've got the first aid just in case anything is to happen. And then they've got the coaching qualifications. So those players that obviously come to that environment and, and want to understand how to learn and play the game, it's delivered in a safe and, and inclusive way. So every player has the opportunity to play within their local football community, whether that's a league or within a club. And then off the pitch, it's about governance, it's about standards, it's about policies and procedures. It's about having all them things in place just in case anything goes wrong. And it's also a baseline for people to build upon so it's about having codes of conduct in place for your spectators, your players, your officials, but it's also having club rules, being constituted and having them policies that really do protect the members and the officials of those leagues and those clubs. I think that's a really important point, actually, the on the pitch and off the pitch. And I'm a volunteer on the Kent Youth League, which is an FA Charter Standard League. I think it's won some awards in the past. It's really, you know, it's held in such high esteem. And one of the benefits of being an accredited league is exactly the point you touch upon there. The players know that they're signed into something or they're playing in a league that, you know, really is the top of its class, so to speak. The parents understand what that means. The volunteers, the coaches alike. It's almost kind of a hallmark of quality and I think it's reflective of the high standards of the game as a whole and I know that the FA and this scheme is held in really high regard across similar governing bodies in Europe and so on but equally I know it's something that you are so incredibly passionate about as a volunteer and a professional working in the game. Yeah, I really am passionate about it. and if you obviously we've got a full podcast on the accreditation and it's sort of it is my area of work and I really do warm to it and get to speak about it. But it is well renowned, Charlotte. I've had the opportunity to uh, go away with UEFA twice since I've been into this role and it's been, it's been the opportunity for me to go and represent the accreditation programme. And when I say it's well renowned, what I mean is it, we, we have an accreditation programme like no other. There's no other nation or any other governing body that comes even close to what we've got in this country. And it's a big thank you to the, that accreditation family, that football family that's part of it. It's because they make it what it is. Like I say, it's been in existence for 20 years. And what that means since its inception is that the criteria has evolved over time and it's been a collaboration between the FA, key stakeholders and those within the game that's made sure it's remained fit for purpose. So as coaching qualifications have evolved and obviously the learning and the the implementation of what good practices look like, how how players learn, how they enjoy the game and why they play, that has come within the accreditation and being able to be communicated and cascaded far and wide. And obviously as we've moved into the world of needing better safeguards, better policies, better procedures, the right insurance and stuff like that and making sure that clubs and leagues are built to last off the pitch, that's evolved over time as well. And I've obviously, like I say, seen it when I first was with my club back in 2009 and we went through it. And at the time, it, the policies and procedures then have changed and evolved to what they are now. And we're going to do a similar sort of exercise this summer, of which obviously we'll touch upon a little bit later within this podcast. I think obviously there are two things that come out of your answer there. One, the fact that the FA Charter Standard has been around for such a long time is an example of the merits and why people, if they're not already, should think about become affiliated. And secondly, the fact it's held in such high regard across Europe, across other sports as well. There's got to be something in that. And there will be some people tuned in that have maybe seen this as a good podcast to listen to because they don't know much about the affiliation and their team, their club, their league might not be affiliated at all. Alternatively, they might have heard some things about the accreditation that are, are some myths. Are there any things now that you've got the opportunity that you want to kind of debunk, 
clarify to anyone that might have any misconceptions about it. Yeah, well, I, I certainly try and share the ones that we hear of, of, of nationally. And some of it is about the expense that comes with it. Straight away, it's free to apply. It's free for anyone to apply. And we've got a team within County Affairs and ourselves as National FA staff and also those within the game that have already been through it that are there to support and to help. We have the relevant services within the game to help support that. So when we say it's free to apply, it is free to apply. It's an application process. There's obviously criteria to adhere to, which might come at a cost in terms of getting a qualified coach with a youth team. But that's a significant investment in understanding how a player learns and why a player wants to play. And essentially, you think about why leagues and clubs exist and you think about the Kent League, Charlotte, you exist for the players and if it weren't for the players and the experience that they're expecting for it to be a safe, fun, inclusive and ultimately a fun one week in, week out, if they don't continue to return, then we wouldn't have a game and our leagues and clubs wouldn't exist. So that's one of the biggest myths around it that is too expensive. Or, and one of them is also around the eligibility to apply. Some clubs and some leagues, obviously, we spoke about earlier in terms of the different levels and being able to apply, feel they are obviously sit outside that. Currently, we've got 79% of all of our affiliated game that plays within the accreditation programme, and that's why it's world-renowned. That's 61,000 youth teams and 10,000 adult teams. But what we've also got that sits outside of that, Charlotte, is we've got... We've actually got 69,000 youth teams. So we've got around 8,000 youth teams that are part of the accreditation. So that is players potentially not getting access to a qualified coach. Having access to a qualified first aid, uh, that's pitch side just in case something does go wrong. And potentially not having the right policies and procedures in place off the pitch. So structurally, are they actually set up and sound for if anything does go wrong as well? And then in terms of leagues, there's 1,100 grassroots leagues out there and only 400 of them are accredited. Now, there's a big ask on leagues because we ask them to have over 60% of their clubs accredited, but it's putting that work in, and we're going to hear from Dawn Bannett from the Southern Sunday League on this podcast in a short while, and she's going to talk about the work that they did. So you're going to pick up some top tips there on how becoming accredited is having that relationship with your clubs and showing them the different rewards and the benefits to being accredited. Long answer there, Charlotte, I know, but there, there is so much within the accreditation. And once I get going, I don't get going. <laughs> well, no, it's a comprehensive answer because ultimately, particularly at the moment, we all really miss football and we want to return and, and be you know completely fit for purpose. And for some people, it might be a bit daunting to begin that process to becoming accredited but what you've outlined there is not only is it free it's accessible there's support and the benefits in the long run are going to be huge there might be people tuned in now who that's encouraged and that's that's the main thing really is encouraging people to provide football for all in the best way possible and I know that you called on you mentioned her there Dawn Barnett you had a really good chat with her because not only is Dawn a part of an FA Charter Standard League she's also part of an FA Charter Standard Club so yeah it's going to be a great conversation I imagine. Yeah, and obviously before we go into that little bit with Don, I just want to add as well, like you say, as the FA, as the national team, we're really proud to obviously govern the accreditation programme. We work with clubs, leagues, those within the game in understanding what the criteria should and look like and be fit for purpose. And we've been doing that over the last three years because we're going to talk a little bit and I've got some breaking news for those that are listening around the accreditation and what's happening this summer. And also these the 50 strong County FA network that have a development team that are there to support you. They're really proud to lead accreditation locally. So if you're potentially one of those clubs or one of those leagues that's sitting the percentage outside the 79% of the accredited family, talk to your County FA, ask them what, the, what they can do to support you on that journey. And then obviously we've got those within the accreditation now. They're the, they'll also support you and talk about the journey that they went on all our policies, all our procedures, everything that you need to be satisfying off pitch structurally, all the templates are there for you to be able to adopt, take, read, utilise and even tweet to be more fit for purpose for your club and why you exist. And then on the pitch, it literally is just about getting through those qualifications. And we all know it's difficult in identifying those volunteers to step up. And, and take on these qualifications. But I tell you what, you speak to someone that's gone and done these qualifications, it means a lot to them. 
and if, especially if they're child's playing within the team, you, you you speak to them and we see a, a lot of the feedback. And I know myself from going through the coaching for qualifications, it adds so much value to what you offer those players and those kids. And you want them to turn back up next week. So understanding the key like coaching topics, the key sort of sessions that you can put on to make sure that it's safe, it's fun, it's inclusive... It, it really is why that is part of the on-pitch criteria. Well, you said let's talk to someone who's been there and done it. Let's catch your chat with, with Dawn Barnett from um, the FA Charter Standard League and Club. If you're ready to be built to last, this is the podcast for you. So I'm really pleased to welcome Dawn Barnett. Dawn, I know you do so many roles uh, within your patch to help support clubs and leagues, in particular around FA Charter Standard. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on this episode of In The Box to talk about it. But first and foremost, Storm, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you're involved and where you are? Hi, um, good afternoon. Thanks, Tom, for inviting me on. It's a real pleasure to come on and discuss Charter Standard with you today. Um, yeah, I'm. my name's Storm Barnett. Um, I live in Putney in southwest London. Um, currently, I am a chairwoman and treasurer of a, a club in the Southern Sunday League. We're called Wimbledon Town. Um, and I've got two teams in, in the league. Um, in addition to those two roles, I sit on the league committee um, and I'm the Chartered Standard Coordinator. So I'm responsible for all things Chartered Standard within the, the clubs that are in our league. And we've got 99, I think, at the moment. So I lays with all 99 clubs around all things Chartered Standard. So, yeah, quite busy. Um, voluntary, obviously, I'm a volunteer. Um, and, yeah, I... The, I love the roles and I'm very passionate about Charter Standard, which is why I'm on here. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Don. And before we get into it, why football? How did you end up volunteering and how did you end up taking on the number of roles you've got across <laughs> both club and the league? Uh, well, it's the usual it's the usual story of, um, you know, most of us start as parents on the sidelines. Um, and my, when my son was very young, um, he played football uh, for in Barnes and, and for little little leagues in Fulham and that's where it started really and um, I grew up around football I think my first football game I was five years old my dad took me into the stands at Stamford Bridge so it, it was it was always there um, how did I become involved as a volunteer I think the same as most people you're in and around football and somebody asks that question and and my son he's 31 now but he he was very passionate about football he started the club that I, I run. Uh, he founded it with a couple of friends from from college, um, and Mum come along and watch. And the next thing I knew, I was the club secretary. <laughs> um, and then I was there every Sunday on the sidelines, and it just became part of of, of life. And um, he went on to be a player manager and a coach at the club. And and then eventually I became chair of it. It's 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 how it happens. It's it's not planned, and it's how most of us fall into it. And it's it's part of our Sundays, and it's unbearable not not having that at the moment um, in lockdown because it's become part of our lives. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how most people get into it. But that's why football, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's true. I think that's when you, I speak to most volunteers and me, myself, that's how you fall into it. It's so great that it becomes a family affair. Yeah, and I, I love how you say it becomes part of your Sundays. And like you say, yeah. everyone's finding it really difficult now. But hopefully we'll be back to them soon. Fingers crossed. So you say 99 clubs within the league. Yeah. So you probably started volunteering in your club initially. Yeah. And then the league probably came calling because they saw organised and stuff you was within your club, I assume. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I, you know, I, I, I've i been in the league. My club's been running since 2013. So obviously I know, um, I knew a lot of the committee members. Uh, I knew Graham really, really well. Um, I know a lot of the referees. And, and Graham... Graham knew that I was thinking of, of of taking early retirement back in 2018 and I had always joked with him that I would come on the league committee as and when I departed my career in the NHS and he held me to that and literally I I, I had my notice in and you know he was there knocking at the door you said you'd come on the league committee and 
it was the perfect opportunity. Um, Graham always had this vision that the league would become chartered standard. And he always said to me, you know, there wasn't a capacity for somebody to take on that piece of work. It's it's a big job. It's it's a it's a mammoth task to coordinate that many clubs. Um, and he said it was an opportunity to to grab me at a time where I was going to have more more time on my hands. And hats off to him. He he did he did extremely well. Um, and he knew that. I'm a complete finisher, so it was a, a specific piece of work that he knew I would see through to the end, and um, that's that's how how he got me on board, and I'm still there. Who's who's Graham? Just so Graham Rodber is the chairman of um, the Southern Sunday League, um, yeah. and um, we're a, you know we're a we're a we're a good you know strong knit committee. Uh, committee. We most of us have got jobs outside of what we do as volunteers, um, but my specific role was around taking the project of chartered standard uh, not not just from getting clubs through the through the process of charter standard but actually promoting it explaining what the benefits would be to clubs bringing clubs on board that had one never heard a charter standard or probably weren't in a position to, to put themselves in in a place where they could apply so it was a lot of promotion a, a lot of cajoling a lot of explanation so it was a big piece of work and I think Graham was right. You had to have a specific targeted person to take that role on. It, it wasn't something you could tag on to, I don't know, for example, registrations secretary or um, referee secretary. It's, it was quite a big task. So, yeah, that's that's why I was brought on to do. So for those listening as well, to, for a league to become charter standard, they need a threshold of their clubs to be charter standard as well. So... This is probably why Graham identified yourself, Don, knowing that you needed to get so many clubs over that threshold, of which is currently 60%, in order to apply. So how many yeah. clubs was currently charter standard within the league when you took the role on? Um, none. None? None. <laughs> none. And in actual fact, we had none. And then we didn't start at... at we're 99 now, but we didn't start with 99, which is another um, task that he kept um, giving me because the figures kept changing. Uh, he kept me on my toes. Um, but there were there were none. There were absolutely none. So what I did is work. it was a lot of work. So what I did is I, I took the initiative and I thought, well, you know, I have to lead by example. And, and if we're going to get this rolling my club has to be the first. So I used Wimbledon Town as, as the benchmark and, and, and said, look, my club's been through the process. And, and then quite a few clubs followed very, very quickly. Um, then we had a few clubs joined that were already chartered standard. Couple didn't, didn't take our numbers up greatly. Um, but each, each, each season we have taken on more clubs and the league has grown. So every time I'd reached the 60% threshold, Graham would interview a load of new clubs and my threshold would change. So, so he really did, he really did keep me at task, I have to say. But yeah, we, we have hit the 60%. In fact, we're over the 60% now. And in fact, I'm working with 10, 10 clubs at the moment, which will take us up to, I believe, 80 of our clubs of the 99 will be chartered standard. So we're actually hitting our next threshold, which is 85 oh, percent. So that's absolutely it's, super. It's great. Yeah, yeah it's it great. is great. And obviously, like you say, it, for anything to be done well, it needs to be done right. And I think that's why Charter Standard exists for us at the FA and that obviously there is a process to go through, but it's to make clubs and leagues better for the long-term sustainability. But in terms of you, going back to you said about cajoling and a lot of sharing the benefits, what did you find was some of the key benefits and some of the key messages that you shared in order to take them clubs on that journey with you? I think the biggest message that, that, I, I took was, you know, this is around good governance for your club. It's to show that you're a, a well-run club, um, and that you're that you're here with a with a game plan for the future, and you're not you're not just here for the here and now. You want to make your club the best-run club that you possibly can. You want to attract and retain your players, um, and and attract good good coaching staff because you know a lot of grassroots football clubs, you know, they do have their own coaches, and you know if you're a coach and you see chartered standard accredited club, you're going to think well. These guys mean business. They're, they're professionally run. You know the days of, and I think I said this in our in our um, our webinar, the days of you know 
chaps rolling out of the car on a Sunday morning, you know, with, 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 with a, a bottle in their hand and, you know, and, and, and no fitness. Grassroots football has changed dramatically and players take it very, very seriously. They want to play at the best clubs. They want better facilities um, they want to be at a club that they know that they respect the values of, of things such as the, the respect campaign it's a totally different landscape to what it was before um, and I think that's what I tried to push and promote um, with our clubs and to take this stigma away that you can't you can't be professionally run because you play football on a Sunday is an absolute nonsense and that's what I what I used as a driver um, obviously the other thing I used as a driver was that the access to funding streams. And one of the things that I was really struck with when I went to Wimbledon Town through the process was there were these pots of money that we could have tapped into in 2013 or 2014, and we knew nothing about. And we only knew about them because of the chartered standard route, because once you become chartered standard, you are automatically emailed about these benefits and these reward packages. Um, so you're, you're there at the forefront you know, being being advised there's a pot of money, you can bid for this. You know, I, I often say to clubs, even now, you know, it's expensive to run a football club and nobody will tell me otherwise. And even at grassroots level, the pitches cost thousands of pounds. If you have access to pots of money, why would you not use them? And I think I listened to your, uh, your, your previous episode and I think Charlotte picked up on this point as well, that there are so many clubs that that don't know how to do that. You know, they don't have the skills to write, um, you know, a, a put put together a bid or, or present their case to to be considered for funding. And I think there's a little bit of a gap there, which we as a league are, are trying to, to help our clubs to to change that. But the funding stream is definitely a way that I I brought clubs on board. And it's not just about money, Tom. It's also equipment. I mean. You know, you, you receive a, a Nike voucher for a hundred pounds to, to a Sunday League football club. That's that's a lot of money, um, and I know teams that have gone on and used that to buy equipment and footballs. My own club used it towards a, a third a third kit. Yeah. Um, you know, these are you know, again, you're talking five, six, seven hundred pounds just just for a, a fairly basic football kit, not even top you know the, the, the top draw um a football kit so I, I sold that to them as well around the benefits and even now i have clubs messaging me saying i've just received another box of of nike footballs from from the fa and you know it's it's like christmas you know yeah. footballs cost money everything costs money so that was another way um that i i i sold the chartered standard um, dream, as I call it. The dream, yeah. And it, it's exactly that. And obviously, as being able to provide them rewards, depending on who our partners are and stuff at the time, is obviously brilliant. But it's like you say, it's them benefits that sit behind that. So the funding, the access to them, the access to grants, you're showing that you're structured well on and off the pitch. And I think, like you say, the experience on the pitch within a chart standard environment from what we see nationally in terms of the stats that we get back is much better than those clubs and those leagues that are operating outside of the charter standard environment. I would agree. And I think if you could just tell us a little bit more on that, what's the experience like on a match day now for those players? Because obviously we're getting pulled from pillar to post. There's that many things we can go and do and give up our time for. So you want your football to be competitive obviously because they're of an age where they do want it to be competitive and like you say they take it seriously but they also they want the respect they want the qualified referee they want to make sure that it is a good experience that they're going to come back next week what's it like in the league now now you've got them clubs charter standard i would say it's um i would say it's a massive positive um i, I mean I, I will say that you know we, we've always run our league in as professionally as we possibly can um, and where there would be incidents of poor discipline or, or standards that don't don't meet the criteria that, that we set in this league we would we would address those but I do feel chartered standard has helped us as a league you know to, to promote that wider with our teams and you know we 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 do expect you know standards the standards are high in our league but i think they have improved greatly with the introduction of the chartered standard mantle and i think because 
people aren't turning up in, in kits that don't match because they have access to funding to have the right kits, to have the right footballs, to have the right equipment. And, you know, if we go and stand on Clapham Common on most Sunday mornings as a league, we're very proud of what we see, you know, of our players in, in full kits, all matching, yeah. all, you know, being respectful towards match officials. Um I, I just I think grassroots football is in a really, really, really good place. And I really do think that the, the chartered standard accreditation is absolutely vital to that. And it and it's vital to keeping keeping us where we need to be and, and further afield. I think we can do even more as leagues. I really do. And Don, I mean, it, it excites me to hear you speak like it because you know how passionate I am about chartered standard. We, we spoke numerous times. Obviously, we're in a state right now where we can't get out, but I can't wait to come down to Clapham Common and actually see all the teams taking part right. and obviously getting to meet you in person. Don, obviously, you you don't even realise, but obviously I want to share with you today is that, and for those listening, Don joined us on a webinar back in November and we was talking about charter standards to non-accredited leagues and why they should become accredited leagues. Since that webinar, Don, we've had 10 leagues become charter standard thanks to the messages Great. that you communicated and everything that you did. So thank you ever so much for continuing to fly the flag of why Charter Standards important. Thanks for joining me today on this call. Uh, I wish you all the best for the future. And like I say, I can't wait to get out and see you all soon. You're watching In The Box. The podcast for grassroots football. A huge thanks to Dawn there. Obviously, some fantastic work that's taking place, both within our league and within our club and the rest of the team within the Southern Sunday League and obviously those within that league, those clubs that have stepped up and obviously adhered to becoming FA Charter Standard. I think one of the key messages that I took away from that conversation with Dawn was around, obviously, that grassroots football is competitive and it can be competitive on some players on the pitch cross that white line but off the pitch if we're all structured correctly and we've got the right policies the right procedures the right governance in place it means that I'm going to have a team to play next week because if they are structured effectively and we have clubs and teams start to drop out and we've seen it nationally the trend the decline within the adult male 11 v 11 game is those that are non-accredited they aren't necessarily set up effectively and set up, as we say, built to last. So it's it's working together and collaboratively to make sure that you set up off the pitch so you've got a team to play next week. So Charlotte, I know that you've had a fantastic conversation as well this week. Yeah, I have. And I think I completely echo your sentiments there. That conversation was really eye-opening and quite similar actually to a conversation that I had with Terry Jennings. Now, Terry is the chairman of Chaddington Park sports club and i we had a five ten minute chat and honestly i was so inspired by the work that he and the volunteer network have done in manchester alongside their county fa and i think it will add further inspiration to those of you tuned into this podcast if you're ready to be built to last this is the podcast for you I am so delighted to be joined by the chairman of Chadderton Park Sports Club, Terry um, Terry Jennings. Terry, Tom has told me so much about your football club, the amazing things that you do. And it, I'm just so delighted to have you on in the box. Can you firstly tell me a little bit about yourself, your club and how you got involved in your role? Uh, absolutely. So basically, I've been... I've served with the club now for the last 17 years, so it, it feels like a bit of a, a sentence, but, you know, it, it's football, we love it, uh, and we're all here for the right reason. So, 17 years, um, I think it was back in 2004 when my first son, Joseph, who's now 22, just about to get on to 23, he, uh, he joined the club, uh, and at the time, it was the, the first mini soccer team um, that the club had produced. And one of the few that the uh, the country had produced at the time when mini soccer was sort of getting out there and becoming really, really popular with the, with the FA and how they was implementing it. And it was, it was, it was a great step forward for football. Um, and, and then since then, it's, it was my second son. So in 2008, uh, I had Frankie. Uh, it took me six months for Frankie to get involved in the game. 
taking him, not wanting to go, and just the absolute nightmare you can imagine of parents parenting coming to its proper test. But we got there in the end, and now he absolutely lives and breathes football. Um, and, and from there, I got involved, you know, in coaching, like I say, in 2004, um, with my first son with a mini soccer, took it forward, got into about under 17s or something, and then later on when the club had asked me to join the committee. Um, uh, and basically from there, I became vice chair uh, up to about four years ago, three, four years ago. And then our old chairman, he stepped down and they were looking for somebody to take the reins and take it on. He, he was just stepping out of office, if you like, when we'd, um, the year after we'd, we'd won the National Club of the Year Award, the, the FA one, uh, the, the Grassroots Award. Um, and then I became chairman about three years ago. Um, I've not looked back really. It's not, I've got no regrets. Sometimes it can be, you know, testing, challenging, but that's why we're here. That's why we're, we're, we're here to make things better and try and uh, achieve our goals, should we say. Absolutely. And I think your journey and your story is probably similar to a lot of, of volunteers kind of getting involved primarily through your kids and then just taking on more and more responsibility. And I can see behind you there, there are a lot of certificates. I strategically um... replaced them because I thought <laughs> I'd look at what all the MPs do when they're all having interviews and stuff. And I just thought, I'll just put that one there. Yeah. So you've, you've got the old sports awards, which we've won quite a few times, actually. Um, over the years, we, we have the... the awards over at the Queen Elizabeth Hall um we've not won every year but we've been there every you know quite a few years anyway uh and then we've got the grassroots finalist club of the year award which is where we won the, the grassroots club of the year for the national FA. and then the most recent one which is probably the most prestigious one we've won up to date is our uh, UEFA award which we've been awarded for the for the last year <laughs> Uh, where we, we are the silver awardist. So out of 55 countries, a million teams, or whatever that boils down to, um, we've got the UEFA award for coming second. That we is absolutely. Came second to a, a team over in Holland, I think it was. That is incredible. That really, really is. And um, it gives lots of people inspiration and something to aspire to. But taking it back to, I suppose, almost the basics, we're talking about the FA Charter Standard Accreditation. How has that helped your club? Well, if you, if you could, you know, when I think back to first becoming Charter Standard, I, th I think it was, it could be all the way back to about 2006, uh, when our very old secretary, Steve Lynch, uh, who's no, no longer with us, but he was... He was absolutely determined to get the club to, to charter standard. I remember the day specifically, um, and he actually came in and went, we've got it, we've got charter standard. And, and, and we knew from then that it, it would put a message out to parents about the seriousness that the, the club takes, you know, safeguarding. You've got all the different sides, although... Um, <clears throat> You've got the football side, you know, behind the scenes, you, you've got lots of things to consider, such as your safeguarding, your first aid, uh, your coaches' qualifications, you know, all, all things that really put the message out, as opposed to the community, to, to make them understand that if you are going to join a club, you know, be it Chatham Park or somewhere down on the south coast, wherever it is, that um, you know by joining a charter standard club that you you know, that club has had to go through quite a lot of behind the scenes work to make sure that they're up to a standard to be able to provide a service for children that is legit and has the best interest of the kids at heart. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's all to do with that and, and knowing that your child is, is joining that team, that club that is diverse, inclusive. So it, there's loads of things, you know, that, that, it, that it offers. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if I was to ask you to pick one of the best benefits of being part of the FA Charter Accreditation Standard Programme, what would it be? Um, I, would, I would probably say the support that you get. Um, you know, without doubt, that there's always, always somebody at the end of the phone to, to try and help you support with resources, maybe, you know. There's certain things when you when you're starting up as a fresh club, you might not have somebody that's coming and sponsor your club. You might have to go to the FA and 
you know, cap in hand and go, look, we've got something really good that we can set up here. We've not quite got the resources for this equipment, for, you know, tapping into maybe a mentor that might be needed to, to guide you along the way. Um, and, and something that a real good benefit is, is those, you know, type of things, getting the support off your thing. And like I say, it's just a phone call away. It's, uh, it's quite handy, especially, you know, from our experience with our FA, Manchester FA, with, with Colin Bridgeford and Rachel and the full team over there. Um, you know, everything down to the development, it's, it, it's great, really. Yeah. No, but do so, you know what? It feeds into that mantra, doesn't it, of creating football for all. And for me there, it seems like a, a bit of a kind of really productive cycle in that the FA accreditation, being an FA Charter Standard Club, it brought in that that ethos of, like you were saying, um, a hallmark so that the parents and the wider community knew the standards that you set, that you achieved that. And then yeah. that was then the platform to build the engagement with the parents, which I'm sure we could have a, no, a whole other episode on because yeah. it's so vital, especially for family um, community clubs. And you have done so much. The club has done so much. Specifically now, what, what's the next challenge for you? What's the next offering that you're hoping to provide as a um, club that you haven't done before? Well, we, we, we feel like we've we've got lots, lots more to offer. Cheddarton Park, you know, we're, we're, we're nearing 100 teams over um, three codes of sport, with the majority being football. But we still feel we've got much, much more to offer. Um, and we, we are working closely with our local council and um, the FA. And what we're trying to do is we've, we've, we've been looking at some sites where we can create our own stadium facility, 4G pitch, netball pitch, indoor gym for our cerebral palsy, um, disability kits that we've got. And, you know, once we've got something like that set up, then our next thing would be, right, what can we do next? What, what does the community need? Can, can we... And we push it out there so that we're offering volleyball and, um, you know, lots more five-a-side sort of games for kids just coming off the street that aren't part of the club that you try and entice them. They might be 16, 17, and they've got nowhere to go. Um, but just, just having that facility. So, fingers crossed, you know, it's been our, for the last 10 years, it's been our ultimate goal to be able to have our own study or our own facility that we can call our home. And, and also provide a real good level of uh, adult football reaching into northwest counties and things like that. that that's where we're trying to head. Yeah, it sounds like an amazing vision and I will keep my fingers firmly crossed for you and shamelessly plug as well that um, as part of the FA Grassroots Hub that we're providing, we have got a fantastic webinar um, that we recorded earlier in the week with some of our FA Club consultants about being um, funding ready, future proof and so on. Um, so definitely go and check that out as well. But I just want to say a massive thank you to you, Terry. Um, I was introduced to you through... Tom, I hadn't heard of the club before. And as soon as I did, I was just blown away by what you guys do. It's absolutely incredible. So thank you for coming on in the box, sharing a bit of your story, your inspiration as well. And good luck for that stadium Brilliant. vision. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks for having us. This is In The Box. Thanks again to Terry for giving up his time to share the story of his experience being part of an FA Charter Standard Club, an award-winning one at that. And I think the takeaway for me was it added some real fuel and, and fire in terms of looking ahead to the future and wanting to come back stronger because it's a cliche, it's a football cliche, I'll get it in there, but, but Tom, COVID has had a massive impact. And it's one of the questions I wanted to ask you because I think a lot of people might be unsure if there is someone tuned in from a club or league and they absolutely understand the benefits and they want to start to become a charter standard outfit, can they still do it given the current circumstances? Yes, Charlotte, yeah, they, they certainly can. Um, what we've looked to do during the COVID impacted season and obviously shutting down last season and stuff is it, it has been an opportunity for us to look away from the pitch. Obviously, we want the players to be playing, but whilst they are playing, what are people able to do? And we wanted the accreditation still to be accessible through the application process, whether that's a club or whether that's as a league. What we had to do with that and to support that was look at an interim criteria. So some of them solutions, whilst we can't deliver face-to-face -face education, 
So obviously what we ask for with youth teams is to have a, a minimum level one qualified coach with safeguarding and first aid and obviously the DBS checks. And what we've done whilst all this has been taking place is FA Education launched the FA Playmaker supported by BT, which is a digital, digitally delivered online course so accessible for those that have access to a laptop and the internet to be able to go and complete that. So what we've asked people to do, whether you're already already accredited and you've got volunteers that haven't had the opportunity to do the level one, or you're those that want to come into the accreditation family, is go and complete the FA Playmaker supported by BT. All you have to do is search that in the boot room, or if you want more information on what the interim criteria solutions look like for your club or for your league, just go to the fa.com forward slash charter standard to find out more. It's really worthwhile saying as well, Tom, that we will put all of these links in the show notes of the podcast as well, because I think especially the FA Playmaker supported by BT, that is amazing, like a great digital resource to use at the moment as well. And Tom, I haven't forgotten, you mentioned some breaking news earlier. So before this podcast is over, I will find out exactly what that is all about. This This is In The Box. Right, Tom, enough is enough. At the start of the podcast, you mentioned something about breaking news. I haven't forgotten. What is it? Tell us more. Yeah, I did. Hot off the press. As we said earlier, accreditation has been in existence for 20 years. So this summer, we are looking to evolve the framework onto a new set of criteria for clubs and for leagues. All very positive and all very reflective of what's currently going on within the landscape. Like I say, we do have a world-renowned accreditation programme and that's underpinned by a baseline of criteria both on and off the pitch. So we'll be staying core and true to the behaviours, the values and the culture that accreditation has. That's through qualified coaches, safeguarding first aid, the respect programme, which is now supported by Nationwide and obviously good governance. That will underpin it. But what you'll be able to see is that we're really starting to frame the accreditation around the player and the playing pathways. So every player will always have a place to play within their local football community, supported by those accredited clubs and those accredited leagues. Wow, that sounds amazing. And yet another further step in the history of this amazing accreditation programme. But anyone that wants to find out a little bit more, where can they head? So they can go to the fa.com forward slash charter standard, then pages will be updated. But what we want to be able to do, especially all those that are part of the accreditation family currently, is start to send this information directly to you through the months of April and May in readiness for that transition over the summer. There we go then. Head to that website page, make sure you check out the show notes and yeah, some really exciting changes coming afoot. Yeah, we're so excited to roll this out and we just want to say a massive thank you to the grassroots football community, everybody that's made Charter Standard exactly what it is today. It's because of clubs and leagues and the volunteers, the players, the spectators, the referees, everyone that's been part of it that's given us the opportunity to have this recognised as being world-renowned and being able to continue to evolve it and again take it that one step further from this summer. But I think that note of thanks to volunteers is a a perfect note to kind of wrap up this podcast. Time has escaped us as it always does on In The Box. A massive thank you to our guests earlier. And Tom, can you tell people what they can expect in the next episode? Yeah, certainly, Charlotte. The next episode is about that network of volunteers. We launched the FA Grassroots Football Awards in association with McDonald's for 2021. So make sure you've got your nominations ready so we can celebrate those grassroots heroes. I think we certainly need a bit of a celebration to look forward to as well. So thanks, Tom. I'm really looking forward to that. And and don't forget, if you've tuned in, all of the resources, funding sources and webinars that we've mentioned during this episode will all be listed on our show notes so do have a browse do follow up and use this time to go and find out more about the affiliation program and becoming fa charter standard whether you are a league or a club until the next time take care everyone and stay safe see you later you're watching you're watching you're watching in the box the brand new podcast from the fa for grassroots football 